can't wear my pajamas. Uh, sorry, that's a Skype joke. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I know uh, many of you have worked with uh, a lot of you in the past, and uh, it's very good to be here in person. Uh, I'm going to give a talk, uh, Status of Embedded Linux. This is a talk that I give uh, quite frequently. I kind of update it on an ongoing basis. It's mainly about the status of kernel features, uh, but I'll also talk a little bit about the industry. Um, and I've updated it with some new material that we learned in the last uh, little bit. Uh, it's important to understand the nature of this talk. I, I don't try to go into ex in detail about any particular topic. The basic idea is that a lot of uh, Linux developers, especially in the embedded space, uh, are using older kernels. And so they don't really know they may not be interacting on a daily basis with the community. They may not, might not know about some of the features that are coming up in some of the more modern kernels. So in this talk, uh, I'd just like to highlight lots of interesting features that are going on in the kernel and in the industry. And I have lots of pointers, lots of URLs. Uh, the slides are already available on the Jamboree website. So you can go download uh, the slides. A uh, basic idea is that if you hear something interesting, uh, something that uh, maybe you want to follow up with in your own development work, you'll have at least knowledge about it and maybe a link to go start some research on it, uh, to go looking at it. Um, so this is the main overview that I'm going to cover, uh, talking about kernel versions, uh, then different technology areas specifically that are uh, important to embedded. I'll talk a little bit about the CE workgroup projects, uh, and then some other stuff. So, uh, in terms of kernel versions, just in the last year, we've gone from uh, Linux 4.4, uh, and you can see we've been had a pretty steady uh, release schedule coming out either 70 or 63 days apart uh, throughout this year. Um, I, I like to make a prediction for when I when the next kernel will uh, be released. Uh, my last prediction was about <coughs> seven days. I predicted, uh, I think I predicted 77 days. Actually, I went long just because I, to be different. Uh, so, but the current kernel, uh, as of yesterday, uh, was uh, 4.9 4 RC7. So I think we're really close. I don't know if Linus is going to do it this weekend. He'll either do it uh, this weekend or next weekend, make the official release. Um, so uh, Greg Carl Hartman has already announced that uh, this 4.9 release is going to be the next long-term stable release for the kernel. So that is, this is probably a kernel that will show up in your cell phones and in a lot of products uh, probably about two years from now, which is a shame, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so I've, I've changed the way I'm predicting now. Instead of predicting a specific date, I'm now going to predict a window. And I predict it will either be the 4th or the 11th. <laughs> so, so this way, I am never wrong on my predictions. Uh, that's what I'm doing now. Uh, just what was in each of these kernels uh, has to do with embedded and Linux 4.4. So I'm going to go over this, these lists fairly quickly because I talk about them in more detail when I get to the technology section. Uh, but in 4.4, there was a new feature called Light NVM. Uh, allows the kernel to take control of low-level uh, SSD features. Uh, perf can load, uh, can build and load EPF, EBPF files. ARM64 had 16K pages. Uh, there was support for the Broadcom uh, graphics processor unit. Uh, that's the one on the Raspberry Pi that was integrated into the kernel, which is kind of a big deal. Uh, there's dev free cooling, a new thermal management system went into the kernel, and various pulse width modulation drivers. Um, in Linux 4.5, this was a big release having to do with ARM multi-platform. So there's been a, uh, a bunch of work uh, over many releases to support single kernel image. Uh, and so a lot of code has been refactored and now uses device tree uh, to handle the differences in the device drivers. Uh, in this particular release, 4.5, it kind of we kind of hit a milestone. Many v6 and v7 ARM platforms are now supported, um, and this it may not seem like a big deal. Uh, this is kind of that kind of grungy behind the scenes work, uh, but you can now build a single ARM kernel image that runs on multiple platforms, um, or at least on different platform configurations. Uh, so this is kind of the opposite of embedded. 
because now you can make a big image that runs on lots of things instead of a single custom image. But for certain types of things, I, I know when I was working at Sony Mobile, this was really important to us uh, because uh, having having uh, a single image that we could run on multiple platforms was very handy for testing and and uh, for uh, our release management. Uh, uh, in Linux 4.5, there was not a whole lot of other stuff that embedded. A little bit of stuff. Uh, there was continued mainlining of some SOC features. And uh, in 4.6, uh, there's a big rework of the GPIO system, uh, some scripts uh, for uh, device tree debugging, uh, and uh, and then some stuff having to do with page poisoning. Um, and uh, that sounds like kind of a weird thing to highlight, but uh, we don't. In terms of security. Uh, features uh, that's pretty neat. Uh, the the new page poisoning feature allows you to uh, clear the pages after a free automatically if you set the page poison value to zero. So this actually ends up being kind of a security feature uh, that went in uh, kind of sideways into the kernel. In 4.7, uh, we had the schedule schedule till frequency governor, um, and that is just changes the way the kernel uh, calculates. Uh, the load for the different processes, uh, and that's that's helpful um, for power management mostly. Uh, the VFS layer layer uh, got a little bit more scalable. It can now iterate through directories in parallel. Uh, you have the ability to attach uh, BPF. BPF is Berkeley Packet Filter uh, programs to trace points, and there's been quite a bit of work on BPF in the last uh, year, and I'll I'll talk more about that later. F-trace uh, histogram triggers, so you can actually now do histograms uh, automatically from your traces. Um, and then there's an Android sync file feature that uh, has been sitting in staging for quite a while, actually, and was actually moved up. This this is almost the very last piece of Android that's still in staging. I think, did Binder move out of staging? I think it did. So there's not much left in staging for Android anymore. Um, and so that's kind of interesting. Yeah, I think Oh, ION is still there. Oh, ION is still in staging. Yeah, OK. So the sync file, I wanted to talk about it a little bit, uh, just because now that it's kind of officially part of the main kernel. So sync file is a mechanism in the kernel uh, that has to do with how the uh, buffers for, uh, mainly the buffers for uh, the graphics system are managed. Um, and it allows you to set up uh, what are known as fences so that you can pass the pass the pointer to the data uh, along a pipeline of processes, but not actually allow the other elements in the process to start uh, working on it. Um, what this does is it uh, kind of reduces some bottlenecks and some slowdowns. So uh, a producer driver will uh, send a fence related to a particular buffer uh, to user space uh, via sync file operation. And then some intermediary process, uh, usually something like a compositor, can pass those uh, fenced file descriptors uh, back to the direct rendering manager in some kind of atomic commit. And, uh, and then the consumer of the buffer, so a buffer's been produced, it's got some fences put up around it. Uh, the consumer can actually then wait on those uh, file descriptors uh, before it begins operation on it. So what it allows you to do is kind of get the data flow all the way to con the consumer um, before uh, without before the buffer is actually even ready uh, for to be consumed. So it kind of adds adds some parallelization in there. This avoids a lot of waiting. There's actually a pretty good document talking about this feature. Uh, so that is actually pretty interesting if you're doing graphical work um, to look at that. Uh, I think a lot of times uh, my experience is people have not been using the Android functions. Uh, in some of their other stuff. And it's kind of a shame, because there's some neat capabilities. Um, let's see, in 4.8, this was kind of a big change. There's a new kernel documentation system. Uh, it's based on Sphinx, uh, a new pseudo-random number generator. Uh, and uh, this is only interesting if you're, if you're kind of wonky about security, but uh, there's a new random number generator. Um, ARM64 got support for KXEC and K-probes. And I think one of the bigger things in this release was a new timer wheel implementation. Uh, and that this mainly has, um, has ramifications for real time. So the person who worked on this was Thomas Leister, who's the, the maintainer. Well, he's next. 
86 maintainer and the NRF IRT maintainer. And also has been his main thing though is RT preempt. Um, and so they actually redid the timer wheel inside, which is how uh, timeouts are managed inside the kernel. And it actually has better performance, uh, which is pretty amazing. This uh, the timer wheel has been sitting around in the kernel for years. I mean, like seriously, 15, 20 years. And people thought, well, it just is what it is. You really couldn't do anything to do with it. But uh, he came along, and, and uh, they used some assumptions about modern hardware and the rate of timeouts. And, and basically, uh, the one trade-off they made is uh, that long timeouts, so if you do a timeout that's like in the 5 to 10 minute range or an hour range, it's got lower resolution. But usually, that's not a big deal. You, you don't really care about hitting your timeout right on the millisecond if you've posted a five minute timeout. Um, but because, because they reduce that resolution, it allows to put them into buckets that then can fire uh, a, in a more deterministic fashion. There was something called the timer cascade that you would have. Uh, every once you hit, when, when you hit the end of a, a particular bucket in the time, or timer wheel, you would have to do a bunch of processing, and it was indeterminate how much time that processing would take. Well, now it's uh, almost completely deterministic. Um, and uh, it automatically co coalesces a bunch of longer timeouts just by nature of the data structures. So it also improves uh, the amount of time you spend in, I spend in idle. So it had per performance benefits, it had real-time benefits, and it had power management benefits. That's pretty amazing. You could take a 15-year-old data structure and do some tweaks on it and, get, and make it all the way around better. Uh, pretty cool. Um, in Linux 4.9, uh, we have virtually mapped kernel stacks. So I happen to work on, I have worked on kernel stacks before. Uh, I did some work for Sony on this. And uh, kernel stacks, if you've ever actually looked at them in detail, they're, well, before this patch, they were actually pretty super ugly. Uh, the way this, the structures were managed on the stack uh, was not very, they had some stuff at the top of the stack, some stuff at the bottom of the stack. Um, and they've now modified this uh, and the, it, what the new system allows you to put guard pages on both sides of the stack so you can catch underflows and overflows. Uh, that didn't used to be the case. It actually ended up cleaning up a bunch of kernel code and it, it ended up, a lot of people were worried that doing this was going to slow uh, things down, but they, they managed to actually make it faster for process creation. Setting up the stack on process creation is one of the expensive operations. Um, Right now, this is only on x86. Uh, we're hoping to see it uh, also be done on ARM and other platforms. Um, another feature is there are, there's something called time samples that are available in eBPF, and I'm gonna talk about those uh, when I get to tracing later. Uh, and then mod versions. There was a, just recently, a couple weeks ago, there was a discussion about mod versions. Uh, Lena's tried to actually take them out. Uh, mod versions, in case you're not familiar, is a system uh, that does, um, but create some signatures for modules so that you can use binary modules in multiple versions of the kernel and kind of guarantee that the kernel, the structures and stuff, API will match up. Um, and so uh, someone sent some patches, I don't, I don't know all the details, you can go look at the article, uh, to remove this completely from the kernel and they tried that and some people complained so they kind of put it back in, um, and, but it's been deprecated. Uh, so. Uh, if you're worried about, if you use mod versions in your code, now would be a good time to go out on the list and 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 talk about what your requirements are, uh, uh, because they may go away soon. So this uh, this type of thing happens. And we're not paying attention, and stuff goes away. Um, just in terms of overall observations, uh, there's. It's been kind of a slow year for embedded. I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on in terms of SOCs. Uh, drivers, individual drivers uh, getting put up there, board support, that type of thing. But in terms of non-driver features, things like kind of general subsystems that are related to embedded, but you haven't seen a lot of patches go into the kernel recently <coughs> about boot up time or about system size. There been very few system size related patches. Uh, embedded file systems, almost nobody's doing anybody any work on on embedded specific file systems like JFFS2 or UBIFS. Uh, and then embedded security also. All, all of the security work seems to be mostly focused on server enterprise stuff. Now there is, okay, so I'm gonna now qualify that. There is a bunch of work going on with power management because uh, everyone wants power management all the way from the data center down to embedded 
handheld devices. Uh, there's a bunch of real time, there's some real time stuff going on. The RT preamp patches are getting mainlined in this timer wheel stuff I talked about. Um, and then you're seeing a lot of work around solid state storage for SSDs, uh, mostly block based uh, solid state storage. And you see, we're seeing some stuff on GPU drivers. Uh, so there's lots of processor support and lots of device drivers for embedded, but uh, a few areas seem to have slowed down. These are, this is a list of stuff that I've watched in the past. It's kind of interesting. I was really interested in the kernel time patient patches, the state of the real time patches, uh, the persistent memory patches, and then uh, the whole last year, last couple of years, I've been really focused on SOC mainlining, trying to get uh, support for SOCs upstream. And this is the uh, this is the status. Kernel tinification is almost completely stalled. There's very few patches going in lately on that. RT preempt is the exact opposite. It's very it's getting really close. Uh, the Linux Foundation invested, uh, and I'll I'll talk more about this later. But but we're getting really close. Uh, persistent memory. There's a lot of stuff going on, kind of in progress. SOC mainlining is it's kind of creeping along very slowly. Uh, there's very slow progress. Qualcomm has been making some progress. Uh, Samsung has been making uh, really good progress, actually. Uh, but a lot of the other vendors are pretty slow. Uh, seeing one from MediaTek here, I want to comment on MediaTek. Uh, anyway, uh, technology areas. So let's talk about specific technology areas. So boot time, uh, one of the things that happened, uh, this is a little bit over a year ago, was XIP on x86. XIP stands for executed place, and it's, uh, it allows you to uh, not actually have to load code into memory. Uh, it just uses the code directly from Flash. Um, and so there's an obvious speed up uh, possibility there. Uh, that was done uh, a while ago, actually over a year ago, but, but pretty cool. Um, asynchronous probing uh, was discussed at the last kernel summit and the kernel summit before that. Not real, a whole lot of progress has been made, but people are still talking about that. Um, and then also a reduction in probe deferral. So there were some there were some patches that were submitted to the kernel mailing list about deferring probes or on-demand probing rather, um, and they've been nacked. So uh, again, not a whole lot of stuff going on in boot up time. Well, people have submitted patches at least, but they've been they haven't been getting uh, accepted. Uh, the interesting thing, my observation, is uh, I've been running uh, Embedded Linux Conference. I've been on the program committee for uh, 12 years now. And there were no talks at ELC or ELC Europe on boot time this year. This is, that's like really weird. Uh, because everybody is still concerned about boot time uh, for their devices. Um, uh, this, the boot time is not a solved problem. Uh, it, uh, we still, every time we make a product, we're always worried about boot time and, and reducing it on the kernel. Uh, the problem, though, is that boot time issues are unique per platform, and so it makes it very hard to uh, upstream the solutions for those. Um, and usually boot time is subtractive engineering. I'll talk about that more later. There are some good talks at previous events. If you are interested in boot time, uh, there are techniques you can use, but you have to do a lot of the work yourself. Uh, two of the talks that I really recommend are this one by Andrew Murray and by John Mahaffey uh, have some good talks on uh, techniques for doing this. And then, of course, that's just the kernel perspective. A lot of boot time problems are not in the kernel, uh, specifically on Android. Android is the worst at boot time, uh, cold boot time. Uh, you're talking, it's just gotten worse over time, and there's no signs it's going to get better. Um, usually 30 to 35 seconds. Um, let's see, uh, device tree. So the recent work going on with device tree, there's device tree overlays, uh, and uh, I don't know, Frank probably knows more details about this, but uh, it's, it's, it's okay shape right now, but it's still, it's an iffy shape right now, okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's evolving rapidly, it's gonna be transformed in a significant way. Oh, it's gonna. It's gonna. We're moving to connectors as oh, much okay. as possible. So you're actually re refactoring it or re-architecting it, it? It's gonna look different from the perspective of the device tree source. If you're familiar with that, so right now an overlay is just adding additional information to an existing device tree. What we want to say is that most boards, once you use an overlay, actually have a physical connector, and you plug a physical card into that. So we want to abstract. We want to 
actually show that we, we do have a physical connector and describe that in the device tree. And that connector is a certain type of connector, like a PCI bus or a beagle bone connector, which has certain attributes. And then any overlay or card we want to plug into that knows it needs to plug into that type of a connector. So we'll be, connect, we'll be connecting that from one side to the other. So it'll become okay. much more strict. So some changes there. Yeah. Who's working on that? Is that Pantelis still, or? Pantelis, David Gibson, me, yeah. <laughs> quite okay. a few people. The other, the other thing going on with Device Tree, there's a couple things. There was a, a project going around about Device Tree validation uh, about a year ago by Matt Porter, but that ended up getting stalled. So there's a, there's a real desire to be able to get device tree information and, and validate it. Right now, the bindings, which it describes uh, what attributes a device tree node should have, it's all just English text. Uh, and so you can't you know, type check it, you can't validate that it's got the correct information in it. Uh, and there's a lot of interest in being able to validate it, but I don't know, is anyone working on it? Well, Grant started getting at Plumbers. Okay. <laughs> So we'll see where that goes. Yeah. Well. So the other thing. So Grant Likely, who was one of the previous device tree maintainers, started working on reworking on device tree validation. He's also been pushing uh, an updated device tree specification. Uh, and uh, the specification that we have now is quite old and uh, out of date. And so there's a big desire to update that spec. Uh, in terms of graphics, uh, kind of the new thing on the horizon is Vulkan API. Uh, from the Kronos group. This is an alternative to some of the APIs that we've been using, Direct3D or OpenGL. In the embedded space, mostly OpenGL. Um, uh, this reduces CPU overhead uh, for a uh, bunch of uh, CPU to GPU operations. Uh, and uh, interestingly, this has gone almost straight to open source. A lot of these came from proprietary systems and then kind of got open source, but this is uh, actually being developed in, in open source. AMD has announced plans to open source their driver. Uh, Intel and Valve are already working on it, and there's actually a version 1.0 that's available now. Um, the other thing in graphics, uh, or one of the other things that's kind of in the industry is a, a concern is the QT license change. Uh, so QT went from uh, LGPL 2.0 to LGPL 3.0, and some companies uh, are scrambling to find an alternative because of that. You really can't, there's a lot of products you can't use uh, use it with use it with that license. And they know, the cute company knows what they're doing. They're doing this intentionally to, to basically convert it into a commercial uh, product instead of an open source product. Uh, in terms of uh, GPUs, uh, there's a, a lot of, in the embedded space, uh, we almost always see integrated GPUs, right? We don't see separate GPU uh, boards or chips. Uh, they're almost always on, on board these days on the, uh, on the main processor. Uh, but it turns out that there's only a few IP suppliers. There's really about five GPUs out floating around in the industry. You know, because ARM supplies Molly as an IP block, which is used by several companies. Same thing with Imagination, that's Power VR. Uh, and then there's a couple others. So uh, because there's a limited number of these, it actually uh, allows uh, for open source projects to kind of spring up. And there are, five, there are four different open source projects that um, uh, have made uh, some amount of progress to support these uh, GPUs. <coughs> Fredrino, uh, there's not one from PowerVR, Etnaviv, Nouveau, and Lima. Um, and uh, all of these are actually uh, uh, doing OK. Uh, it, the, best, the one that's doing, the two that are doing best are Friedrino and Etna They've actually made a, a good amount of progress and there have been some good demos. Um, having open source GPU drivers uh, really does, uh, is good for the industry uh, because it gives uh, customers kind of flexibility to switch kernel versions and things like that. Um, so file systems. The last thing I saw on UBIFS, which is uh, uh, is a file system uh, specific for uh, NAND flash uh, with some stuff to do with uh, multi-level cell. Uh, there's a lot of complexity when you're handling, handling uh, that type of NAND. Uh, it's much flakier, it's, very, it's not robust, uh, and so there's a lot of challenges. And Boris Brazilin, uh, I think he's with Free Electrons, has been working on some of the issues there. So uh, that's actually good. It's good to see that someone's paying attention to this stuff. Um, 
But more and more, what we're seeing is an increase in the rise of uh, essentially black box block based storage. So a lot of our uh, products are now not based on just raw NAND, they're based on EMMC or something like that that has block boundaries and it looks to Linux much more like just a regular uh, block device. Um, but what that means is because it's a black box, uh, the, um, there's a lot of algorithms going on under the scenes, mostly in hardware, uh, that are controlling the performance and the robustness of the system. And uh, that's a problem because almost all of these uh, SSDs are configured to support uh, workloads that are specific to non-Linux OSs. Uh, usually they're optimized for fat file systems for Windows. Um, and uh, so even, even the chips that are used, that are known, to, known that they're going to get used in embedded products that run Linux, they're just, the, the firmware on them is optimized for, uh, for fat file systems. So Light NVM is kind of the solution that's uh, come up around this. So Light NVM is a new system in the kernel for holding uh, SSD parameters. So things like uh, uh, the size of the erase blocks and the, the way the, the uh, things are partitioned on the, on the thing, on the flash. Uh, and it allows the kernel to manage the flash translation layer. <laughs> Normally in a, in a SSD or EMFC, uh, the flash translation layer is managed by the firmware on the device. This allows you to move it out of the hardware and into the software layers um, and uh, allows the kernel to now do the management of that. Uh, and because the kernel knows more about the uh, I.O. parameters and scheduling, uh, arguably it can do a better job. Anyway, if you're interested in this, I highly recommend you go read up on it. Uh, pretty interesting system. There, it does require that you use uh, some of the later, uh, the newer uh, SSD block interfaces. I think there's extensions to SADA that have the, that allow bleed through of those parameters. Anyway, uh, in terms of networking, uh, Bluetooth continues to get more stuff. Uh, Ciflo PAN, which is IP, uh, low power IP uh, is, is in the kernel and pretty well supported. There's a lot of new work on mesh networking. Uh, and there's a bunch of new protocols out there in the industry for IoT. Uh, Thread uh, is uh, Nest or slash Google's low power IP stack. I'm not sure the status of that, how well integrated it is uh, in the kernel. There's a bunch of other ones that used in the IoT space that are not integrated yet. Sigfox, lower end. Um, Anyway, so there's some work to do to get Linux uh, competitive in the IoT space and networking. Uh, real time, the RT preempt uh, project. Uh, there's now a collaborative project uh, that's funded by the Linux Foundation uh, to fund Thomas Flexner. Uh, the executive summary uh, is very short here. Uh, there's a lot more stuff going upstream, uh, which is good. Uh, there was an RT summit held in uh, Embedded Linux Conference Europe in October. And uh, they just, they seem to be continuing to make progress getting stuff merged. Uh, the latest RT preempt patch set. So it's an out of tree patch set. Uh, and if you had to do RT on your systems in the past, you know that that's a real pain to, to manage, uh, having it be out of tree. But it's you're getting smaller and smaller. And I think nowadays the patch is pretty easy to apply. And it's not as invasive as it used to be. Um, but uh, the latest RT preempt patch is for the 4.8 kernel. It tends to follow long-term stable releases, so I'm guessing we'll see one for 4.9, uh, and you can find out more about the project there. Uh, RT is pretty much, um, I hate to say it's a solved problem because it's not upstream, but it's, uh, it's in pretty good shape on Linux. Um, uh, there are other alternatives, though, to RT preempt. Uh, there's a project called Zenomai, uh, that provides, supports either running as a dual kernel or a single kernel configuration. Uh, and you can, you can look at this. This is probably the most popular one outside the tree that uses uh, a dual kernel approach. Uh, this is actually a descendant of the uh, Adios iPipe stuff. Uh, and I could go into great long detail about where it came from, but that's uh, it's, it's actually that Zenomai 3.01 release uh, came out this year, and so they're, act they're still active and it's uh, pretty useful. Uh, and you can find talks about uh, 
a real-time incentivize that we're given at uh, all recent ELC conferences. In terms of security, the big news is that there is now a kernel security hardening project, an official project. Uh, people focus on, uh, instead of doing individual bug fixes, like just finding a single one-off for a, a vulnerability report, going actually in and attacking whole classes of problems. And so this was discussed quite a bit at the kernel summit. Uh, it was just uh, about four weeks ago was the kernel summit. Uh, and they have all kinds of uh, new features that they've gotten in. Mostly they're cherry picking code from uh, a, a product, well not a product, a, a project called PAC. So there's a special security project called PAC that has a whole bunch of extra security. But they're cherry picking patches from that and putting it into the main line um, and making some uh, really good progress at making the kernel more secure. Um, let's see, system size. So some people still care about the size of the kernel, although it seems less and less these days. But uh, kernel tinyfication project appears stalled. Uh, the tiny repository was actually removed from Linux Next. Um, there's been very little activity this year. There's been a few things. Nicholas Petrie did a uh, patch for optional POSIX timers, and Wolfram Sang did some kernel refactoring patches. Uh, that was actually a project that was funded by the C work group, by the way. Uh, but they didn't get rid of a whole lot of size. Neither of those was like really huge, probably about, uh, well, depended on your configuration, but between the, on the order of uh, between 10 and uh, 30K. Uh, the biggest recent patch that went in, that's kind of a uh, contradiction of terms, was the single user patches. Uh, that get re gets rid of users and groups. So if you really, really want to tune down your kernel, you can now actually eliminate users and groups. Uh, and so, uh, and this was mainlined in uh, version 4.1 of the kernel. So it is now possible to remove POSIX timers, to remove print K, to remove users and groups. Uh, but even after you do all that, it, it takes a lot of work uh, to get a kernel that's really, really small. And it, and it still won't get you down to kind of the, the sweet spot for hitting some of these microcontrollers is under 2 meg, and that's still pretty hard to do with a kernel. You can do it, but it's hard. Um, uh, there's some other patches floating around to remove kernel command line parsing, uh, but those uh, were not mainline. Uh, I already talked about the XIP patches. There's some interesting work uh, that Nicholas Petrie, uh, he works for Lenaro, has also done on uh, some compiler optimizations. So there's something called GC sections, uh, and he, uh, there's a, this is a lighter weight option similar to the link time optimization. Um, and I won't go into the detail of this, but what it does is it changes the way the kernel is linked and puts each function in its own section. Uh, and, and then when it goes to linking, uh, there's an optimization pass that if uh, individual function is not used from a module, that can be uh, removed during linking. Uh, and so we've got some pretty good size uh, from that. And these, these types of changes that are compiler level, optimization level changes are, um, I think, pretty interesting because they do, do not require any code changes in the kernel. Um, and so they're much, there is no need to upstream stuff. Well, there's a little bit. He had to upstream. Well, Nicholas, bless his heart, he, uh, he upstreamed stuff, but it's to the compiler guys. <laughs> so, uh, so it's a different battle. The kernel people didn't even have to worry about it. Um, and then Vitaly Wool uh, has been doing stuff with microcontroller Linux. If you search, if you Google his talks at yeah, Embedded Linux Conference, uh, he has some of the best results for, for small footprint Linux. <laughs> In terms of testing, uh, this is, I'm, there's a bunch of stuff going on with testing. Uh, K-Self test, which is the new uh, kernel. Let's see, yeah, I have a whole thing on that. So let me talk about that. So K-Self test is a new system inside the kernel tree. You may not have done this, but it really just started to be relevant to embedded as of the 4.1 release. Just by way of curiosity, who is using uh, kernel later than 4.1 for their products? A couple of two. Oh, okay. Well, that's good. <laughs> okay. So um, you in 4.1, they had cross-build support, uh, K-self-test, um, and um, there's a pretty good talk by Shua Khan, uh, Samsung engineer. She... Uh, She's kind of, uh, she's a lead maintainer on this stuff. Um, this is, a, I think, a very promising uh, new feature of the kernel to self-test. Basically, do unit tests on individual uh, frameworks and subsystems in the kernel. 
Uh, it's kind of still just getting started. It's pretty new, but um, but it's a nice uh, placeholder for being able to do kind of a comprehensive test suite of the kernel in the future. There's a project that is near and dear to my heart, the one I'm working on, Fuego, uh, which is the LTI, LTSI test project. Uh, as far as I know, it's the only uh, project that has an official candy, uh, which is these hot tamales from the US. Uh, we're working on lots of different issues. Um, this was my list that I kind of worked on over the summer, command line tool, device dictionary, test packaging, and some easier tool chain integration. Um, and we're actually going to have a boff later today where we can talk more about what's going on with Fuego. Uh, kernel CI, uh, I would say uh, th this is a distributed, uh, Kernel CI stands for Kernel Continuous Integration. Uh, this is a Lenaro project. Uh, that where a lot of developers have gotten together and there are now, I think, um, a 10 different board farms uh, that are continuously building and testing, boot testing the Linux kernel. Uh, and uh, this is, I think, the most successful public distributed build and test system for Linux in the world. Uh, they have over 2 million builds that they've built and boots that they've done uh, over the past year. Uh, and it's, uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, they, they, uh, well, I, I won't editorialize there, but there's, it's interesting, they really wanted to get beyond just boot testing, uh, but they're finding enough stuff and it's taken a lot of hard work just to get where they are, uh, that they, uh, haven't had the bandwidth to, to move beyond that, but they're finding bugs. They have, uh, found, uh, they keep track of the actual bugs that have been fixed because of things that they found and, um, uh, I can't remember what the number is, like 165 or something bugs. Uh, in terms of tool chains, the interesting thing going on here is really the rise of LLVM. Uh, and uh, there's a developer uh, also working at Lineo who's, who's got Clang running, building the kernel, and a complete distribution in the Octo project. Uh, you can build everything but about 45 packages uh, out of the Octo project, well, in his mini distribution, um, with, uh, with Clang. Uh, so if you want to not use GCC, you can you can uh, avoid having to call your Linux GNU Linux, uh, and uh, just run it on LLVM. Uh, there are presentations, he gave presentations at, at both ELCs this year. In terms of tracing, uh, we have made a lot of big strides, and this is actually one of the interesting areas. So uh, nowadays, everybody uses uh, VPF, Berkeley Packet Filter. Let me just explain what that is. Um, when people added net fil network filtering to the kernel, uh, they added this thing called Berkeley Packet Filter. That, that's the packet in it. It's the network packet is what that name comes from. Um, and it, what it allows you to do is it it, uh, it is a system where there's a virtual machine inside the kernel that runs arbitrary code. Uh, and the original intent was that on a network packet, you could run arbitrary code that would examine the packet and decide whether to forward it or drop it or do whatever. Um, but this uh, subsystem in the kernel, the BPF subsystem, has now been kind of uh, extended to support all kinds of different uh, things where you might run around, want to run arbitrary code that's loaded at runtime inside the kernel. Sounds like a security nightmare. It is a little bit. Um, but uh, you can now do the same type of thing with trace points. So when you hit a trace point, you can now run arbitrary code that you've compiled externally uh, to the kernel. Uh, collect data, uh, collect samples, build histograms, do counts, that type of thing. Um, and so we are now at the point uh, where people say we have equivalent to functionality in the kernel for tracing that the D-Trace had in Solaris. And uh, that is like a kind of a big deal. Oh, see, I forgot to put the link in there. Anyway, um, I'll, I'll, put, I'll update the slides and put the link in there. When I'm when I'm done, um, but uh, so this is actually really really cool. There's a lot of really interesting things you can do uh, in terms of performance monitoring and tracing the Linux kernel and debugging uh, with the new features that we've got. Uh, now, just a couple of miscellaneous points. The next long-term stable kernel is going to be 4.9, uh, and this was announced before it was released. This is the first long-term stable kernel that was announced ahead of time. Various people in the industry requested this uh, so that they'd have time to kind of get their, uh, uh, prepare their source trees for a switchover. Um, 
And we're not, it was even announced before the merge window opened for 4.9, which is pretty amazing. Um, I want to cover a little bit of non-Linux stuff uh, because I think uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the industry. So you're seeing a lot of, in the IoT space, you're seeing a lot of non-Linux, okay? Um, and I'll talk more about that later, but you see Magento was announced by uh, Google. This is a new RTOS. Uh, it's based on a little kernel with a BSD license. Zephyr was announced this year. Uh, it was an RTOS from Wind River. This has an Apache 2 license. It's highly configurable, kind of a standard RTOS thing. It's for no MMU. Uh, and then uh, the big news there is Lenaro recently agreed to support Zephyr as part of their, uh, their IoT project. And so uh, that means that it has uh, some degree of uh, industry support behind it, both the Linux Foundation and Lenaro uh, supporting Zephyr. Okay, so sorry, that was kind of a long blast of technical stuff. Let me just go quickly over a couple of CE workgroup projects, uh, and then I have some kind of overview thoughts. Uh, so the main projects that the CE workgroup is working on right now, uh, this is the Linux Foundation uh, project to, uh, to enhance uh, Linux for the embedded space. There's a shared embedded distribution, uh, device mainlining, LTSI, Fuego, and the eLinux wiki. So the shared embedded distribution uh, is a new distribution based on Yocto, and a combination of Yocto and Debian. Uh, and there's been a lot of presentations about this. If you want to get involved, uh, kind of check out those presentations and talk to kobayashi on. Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> um, device mainlining, the goal here was to study obstacles to mainline and work to reduce those obstacles. Uh, we did a bunch of analysis on source code that was used in uh, mobile phones. And uh, one of the projects we're still working on in this area is a patch submission tool to make it easier for, for people to uh, work with upstream. Um, the long-term support initiative, uh, which is... Uh, we have a kernel specifically uh, that we intend to support for kind of a longer period of time. Uh, and, and also, um, it's hard to describe, but uh, it's, it's geared for the needs of the industry. So we allow, it's a long-term stable kernel with some patches that are not in mainline, um, which is different than the regular LTS release. Uh, and uh, you can kind of see uh, the latest work that was done on this was the kernel divergence measurement tool to see how far away from mainline we were. Um, we continue to support the eLinux wiki where we have a ton of resources. If you want to see, this is a great thing uh, about open source and in particular about embedded Linux conference. If you were not able to go to embedded Linux conference Europe, uh, all of the videos are online uh, and they're available on the eLinux wiki so you can go see the videos. You can go look at the presentations, um, and uh, we keep all of that material so you can you can figure out what's going on and uh, and uh, get value out of it. Just a few other things. Uh, I'd say the two some of the the two biggest uh, organizations that are really working uh, to help Linux kind of that are trade associations are Lenaro and the Linux Foundation. Uh, I can't let this pass without making a comment. Uh, you probably saw a couple of weeks ago, Microsoft joined the Linux Foundation. Okay, that is just mind blowing. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, and I gotta tell you, I, I worked at a, I've worked at several companies where Microsoft was our arch rival, uh, and uh, I just don't trust those guys. Uh, <laughs> So we're going to have to see. They now have a board seat on the Linux Foundation. They're platinum members. Um, so that is just, uh, it's hard to wrap your mind around that one. Uh, the other big news was there are two huge organizations in the IoT space, All Seen Alliance and the Open Connectivity Foundation. And in October, they announced that they were merging as well. And that was that's a really big deal. Um, all Seen Alliance uh, was probably ahead in terms of implementation. They actually had a, a bunch of products in market, uh, but th th there's a lot of political reasons behind the scenes. The OCF got started and had their own view of how things should go. The plan is they've announced that they're going to try and integrate all of their IoT specs and implementations and standards. We'll just have to wait and see if that happens. They just announced the merger, so I know I, I'm on some of these mailing lists. I, there's a bunch of people scrambling to try and uh, make this work. 
um, technically. Uh, but that's a big deal. If they can actually pull this off, it would be really nice. It'd be nice to defragment. You don't see stuff actually reduce fragmentation very often. Uh, this, this could happen here. Um, so uh, this is where I get a lot of my information about the Linux kernel, specifically LWN.net and kernel newbies has some really good uh, stuff. I want to talk a little bit though, just spend a couple of minutes talking about a high level status uh, about the industry. Uh, I want to talk about trends from the last few years and give some high level thoughts on uh, generalization versus specialization. First, overall status in embedded Linux, we're doing great. Uh, I, I tell people that we're in over 1.5 billion devices. That is way, way underestimating. There's at least 3 billion devices just in Android. Uh, and then if you look at the hundreds of millions of cameras, uh, video players, set-top boxes, routers, uh, TV sets, uh, it's, it's probably, I haven't, I haven't taken the time, but it's probably, we're probably up in the maybe uh, 4 billion range, 4 billion objects. Uh, so I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant here. I'm going to complain, but we, we don't have much to complain about. We're, we're the dominant OS in Embedded. Um, and here, but here's my complaint. There's IoT, and if we're not careful, we're going to miss out on IoT. Uh, because all of those leaf nodes, all the things that are running in light bulbs and switches and power lines, Linux is still not small enough uh, to fit in those. So Linux is going to be in all of the gateways. It's in every nest. Uh, it's in you know every gateway that I know of in the IoT space is running Linux. Uh, but it's not going to be in the individual sensor nodes. And so there's a lot of products that Linux is still too big for. Uh, and, the, and most importantly, I'm really disappointed because I don't think Linux is going to be the first OS to run on a serial box. Uh, so, by the way, I can't remember where I got this image from. Is Mother's Joy, is that a, is that a Japanese uh, frosted flake? Is, what, where, does anybody know where that from? I, I found that on the internet. I, it's got a cute little penguin. I thought, I thought that was a, anyway, I don't know where I got this graphic. I'm the one that put the, the dumb the Linux sort of boot thing on there. Uh, but that's not what Linux on a serial box. Okay, so a lot of people when I present this, they kind of laugh because it's like, well, why would you run Linux on a serial box? I can see why you'd run it on a toaster or a coffee machine, but why would you run it on a serial box? And this is the answer right here, is that if you could run Minecraft on the back of a serial box, there's no way if you had your kids with you in the cereal in the aisle at the supermarket, you'd be able to not buy that box. <laughs> so. Uh, Minecraft is like crack cocaine for 10 year olds. Uh, and uh, I think it's going to happen. It's going to happen that we're going to see, so it might not be Minecraft, it might be some other video game, but you're going to see something that requires computational power on your serial box in the future. And so what does it take to get there? Uh, I actually know a little bit about the serial box industry uh, and how much they spend on toys. Usually the, a toy in a serial box is about a dollar. Uh, and so my guess is that if you could get the cost of goods for the, the complete solution to $1.10, you could probably get uh, Linux in a serial box. So this is what you need to do. You need to get a 40-set CPU, flash, and memory. And don't laugh because we're pretty close to that. Okay? That's the, actually we're doing best on that. You need a 50-set display. And I'm, these are made-up numbers, by the way. I have no... You need a 5-set input device and a 15-set battery. Um, right now, you can get a Raspberry Pi Zero for five dollars, right? Which is a whole board, right? That has the flash, the CPU, the memory, and some I/O. Uh, there are input devices that are really inexpensive. Uh, your resistive, you, there's stuff. There are input devices you can now just print on the box that are pretty cheap. So, um, so it's it's conceivable. But what what we're lacking is the types of processors that get you really far down. Linux won't run on. Uh, I want to talk about that. So recently, there's or the trend in the last couple of years has been a, uh, a few key topics where uh, we've seen a slowdown in kernel submissions and in uh, conference talks. Um, and uh, the other area is that we're seeing a lot more RTOSs. I, <laughs> if you had told me a year ago that there would be a new RTOS on the scene, uh, in the form of Zephyr, I, it was like, really, do we need another RTOS? There's probably hundreds already. 
Um, but uh, we're also seeing in this space the rise of permissive licenses, non-GPL licenses. So these are the list of topics that we've traditionally focused on in Embedded Linux. We've always worried about boot time, the system size, the file systems, the performance, and the robustness, uh, especially power management. For IoT space, we really have to have the power management, real-time attributes, and security. And uh, if you look at that, as I said before, in boot time, uh, we, you can get fast boot times. I worked on Sony cameras where we got the boot time down to a second, second and a half, but it was a lot of work. And the, the features to support that are not upstream. Uh, and the reason is that it requires specializing the kernel. Uh, the results are not applicable to other platforms. What you do is you do a lot of concentrated effort on a particular platform to get that platform. Uh, and really, the, this is just bloat by another name. So, uh, and the, in system size, the size of the kernel is the exact same thing. It requires a whole bunch of difficult manual effort on a per product basis to, uh, to make something small. And, and this is the reason, I'm going to explain. The reason is that upstream wants generalization. They want the kernel to have the most number of users and the most uh, applicability to hardware as possible. And so you see, over time, the kernel accumulates lots of code to handle different scenarios. Um, but in order to get small size or, or fast boot time, that means that you're taking stuff out most of the time. Um, and there's a really great presentation on this, Andrew Murray's presentation on boot time. It's really the difference between additive engineering and subtractive engineering. Uh, when I was working on uh, Sony cameras, and my job was to make the kernel smaller, uh, I used to be able to hold up a camera and say, well, you know, what was your contribution to the camera? And my answer was, uh, there's like 200K of code that's not there anymore. Uh, and so, which is weird, right? So I spent months working on eliminating code from that camera. Um, and so, uh, so this is what kind of Linux looks like, if you look at it as a Lego thing. Uh, Linux is this really complicated Lego set that has all kinds of really great features. Um, and it's, it's a really neat toy. It's, it's got all these parts, and, and it's really neat. If you try to take that, that <coughs> big thing, and trim it down, you end up with what I call Franken Linux. You end up with this kind of weird toy that is not really that great of a small toy, right? Because uh, if you think about Legos, when you put them together, when you try to take them apart, they kind of stick together in weird ways, and the parts are not the right shapes. What you really want, oh, uh, let's see, what you really want uh, is you want a, a nice little Lego set with cars. And that's what our tosses are like. Our tosses have these smaller pieces that can fit together and make a nicer car. Now, if you were writing an in-house custom OS, you wouldn't have any of this other junk, right? You wouldn't be talking about Legos. You'd be, it'd be very streamlined. Uh, but think about the setup cost, right? So if I go down to the store and buy a, a little Lego kit, I can make that car in like 15 minutes. If I want to make that other plastic car on the right, I've got to uh, design an injection mold, and it only I only get uh, cost I only get uh, good cost at scale. So it only works if I'm going to do a million of them, right? To take it down and do an injection mold for a toy car, and then I can get something that's like two cents. Uh, so uh, that's the difference between uh, Linux and these R tosses and and in-house custom OSs. Um, so I want to talk about something you're going to hear this afternoon, which is Sony's NetX experience. Uh, so we had a project at Sony uh, to support an audio player. And it was just easier to add a bunch of stuff to NetX than it was to trim down Linux for the same footprint. And the project started you know, a couple of years ago. And so, um, so Sony worked on a bunch of stuff. We worked on board support, C++ support, Elf. Self customizations, open OCD, power management, debug agent, right? So a lot of those things are readily available in Linux, but they're too big. They just would not fit in the on the platform that was the target. And so we had to do a whole bunch of uh, extra work. And I'm not saying that was the wrong decision. I'm just saying that it's a shame that Linux wasn't in a position where we could have 
leverage that same uh, that same stuff. Um, anyway, we'll hear a lot about that project, which is an exciting project, by the way. <laughs> uh, later today. The other thing I want to talk about is I IoT RTOS fragmentation. There are way too many IoT RTOSs. Uh, just looking at the ones that have good licenses. There's even met, there's many, many more with commercial licenses that we don't really talk about that much. But just in the free licenses, we've got Linux, Nutx, Free RTOS, Contiki, Zephyr, Embed. Um, the problem is that there, there's a whole bunch of different licenses. Uh, we can't share code between a lot of these systems, right? You cannot take Apache code. Well, you can. Uh, no, let's see. Can you? No, you can't take Apache code and put it into a BSD project. And you can't take. Uh, and you can't take. Um, uh, you cannot take GPL code and put it into a BSD project, right? That's a big no-no. Uh, and so you have. There's not any sharing between all these different architectures, <coughs> mainly because of the license, also because of the API and the architecture of the different systems. Uh, but I really worry that we're losing the effects of open source uh, because of this fragmentation. Um, uh, and it's hard enough to mainline stuff to one upstream. So if you look at the example here, I give uh, Sony's ELF loading customization. It'd be nice if we could take those same things and make them available on Zephyr or Embed or uh, Free RTOS. But, well, one, there's differences in the APIs for all those systems, but there's also differences in the license, uh, which makes it really impractical and difficult. Uh, so this fragmentation in IoT, it's just like the bad old days of Embedded, where everybody was doing their own stuff in-house. Uh, we're not getting any of the benefits of open source uh, in the IoT space. Uh, and so this is kind of the paradox of embedded. Uh, I gave a whole keynote on this topic. I'm not going to cover the entire thing, but the paradox is this. In the open source community, you really want generalized software because that is what will build up your biggest set of community members to collaborate with and to re and kind of work together to reduce your costs. The problem, and that works great in the enterprise and in the desktop space. In the embedded space, it does not. In the embedded space, you have different requirements. You're looking for deeply customized, deeply specialized software. Um, and so what happens is when you start to specialize the software, you choose some weirdo, uh, sorry, uh, some <laughs> unique uh, <laughs> RTOS, <laughs> right? Uh, then you lose the community effect. You don't have 20,000 people testing that software anymore. You're lucky if you can find two other people on a mailing list. Um, and so how do you balance that tension? I don't have, I don't have the answers. I just kind of want to point this out so that you kind of understand the problem. Um, so I think the absence of a shared, uh, there's a couple of things I think would help. We really should do a shared embedded distribution, and that's why I, I strongly support the, the project that we've been doing the, with the embedded Debian, or I can't, any, and uh, I think we need something in, a, a user space where we can share stuff, non-kernel technology. Particularly, uh, I want to be able to share system-wide optimizations, things like feedback direct optimizations, and security enhancements. So Tizen went off and did a whole bunch of security enhancements. Samsung has those. They're in their distro. And none of the other embedded distros have them. Uh, and it's a real shame. Uh, also, there's a lot of, um, there is, uh, lots of stuff for which there is no upstream. There's a lot of stuff that's, uh, that exists that companies have done, and they're not sharing them. And the one I kind of uh, talk about a lot is test. So why is it in the year, we're in the year 2016, and we're not even sharing our test stuff, right? Everybody does their own testing, and they build it from the ground up. Now, there are frameworks that they share. So there's Jenkins. A lot of people base their tests on Jenkins. Uh, and so that handles some aspects of the test. But like the actual fundamental test code, there's a couple of projects, you know, like XFS tests, but, but no one is sharing their results. They're not sharing their techniques, uh, their test configurations. There's a whole bunch of stuff that could be shared to make testing easier around the industry, and we're not doing it. Um, so we need more sharing. I think. Uh, we need uh, sharing of distribution package work. We need sharing of test experience. You know, what should the results of Bonnie be on a Beagle Bone Black? If I'm, a, if I'm testing the file systems on a Beagle Bone Black, which is the board I happen to have, 
What what results should I see? I don't even know. Uh, what LTP test failures can I ignore? You kind of have to. There's a little, anyway. Uh, recommendations. So here's I am going to make these following recommendations. I think we should use automation in the test space, in particular, to overcome reduction of the community effect. Um, and we should work hard to reduce fragmentation. And this is the most controversial thing I think I said. I think if you're producing code, uh, whether it's for the Linux kernel or for some of these other uh, RTOSs, I think you should produce it under a dual license uh, so that at least that is not a barrier to sharing code with other projects. Uh, it, the kernel already has a model that allows you to push code as, as dual license, G, GPL and BSD, which means that if someone comes along later and wants to grab that code uh, and the information in like a driver and use it, if it's BSD, they can. They can move it to an RTOS. And so this is kind of more directed at, at uh, the kernel developers. Um, and the other thing is, uh, please go ahead and look at other, before building your own thing, look at other systems, at other projects that are doing similar things and try to find commonality. And of course, keep working on a, uh, sending stuff upstream. Um, and that's it. So thank you very much. I think uh, uh, you know the yeah, three answers on those kind of auto uh, uh, licensing issues really serious. Yeah. So that maybe we should make uh, some of the consideration to make uh, some of the common licensing policy or such kind of thing. Like uh, if we patch, uh, make a patch for some of, the, for example, free autos, uh, you should add uh, not only the GPL license but also the uh, you know permission to open autos and also the permission to right. not X or whatever. Right. To make it, make it so that uh, it must be a quad or five, you know, licenses right. should be, uh, you know, listed there. Yeah, well, free art free artos is particularly interesting right. because it's GPL with two exceptions, right. and so you can't take any free artos code. You can't use it in Linux. You can't use it in any anywhere else. So it's really got a weird situation license wise. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, maybe I think. Uh, so that kind of thing will be uh, considered some sort of uh, recommendation which we will be able to make. Okay, anyway, any other questions or uh, discussion, Pamari? Sure, I'm going to ask you to ask you to ask but hey, you, you have a question from uh, Shamsan so to regarding the uh, FIFA system. Okay. Huh? So what's your question? Do you have a question? I didn't ask this question because uh, the session was over a little bit. I'm sorry, I can't. Let it off your go. Oh, do you have a mic? Okay. Uh, in Fiago, uh, how how it is easy to add a new distribution? <coughs> right now, we have the flexibility to add uh, the customization for the toolchain. Right. Uh, so, it, is it possible to improvise to support additional distributions and different architectures, test boards? Uh, okay. So, I'm gonna. Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question, but I'm going to answer it anyway. Uh, <laughs> no, basically, uh, so, what I'm expecting is like. Uh, so there's a couple of. Okay, so Fuego, in terms of supporting a distribution, right? So you can. There's a couple of major build systems in Embedded Linux. You've got Yakko Project, uh, and you've got BuildRoot, are kind of the free ones. Uh, and then people are doing their own custom things a lot of places. Uh, we just added a feature in Fuego. Uh, to support uh, checking the target for specific binary files, which has to do with a little bit of uh, uh, making it distribution independent. So you can at least detect if the distribution that you're running against has certain features. Uh, and we're actually looking at extending that in the future to support things like checking the um, kernel configuration and other things. So. Uh, Right now, we haven't. One thing I've wanted to do with Fuego is make a list of all the dependencies. So we do depend on like the proc file system. Uh, there's some specific features uh, 
in the product file system that we use when we're doing our pretest to set the computer up for testing. Uh, but we should be mostly uh, distribution agnostic. In terms of architectures, that really just comes down to the tool chain. If you can install a tool chain for your board, it should just work. That's, that's the idea. If it doesn't just work, then that's a bug in Fuego that we need to fix. Uh, so I don't know if I've answered your question or not. Uh, uh, yeah, I have one more query. Uh, uh, so Timson's plan is to use Fuego for kernel related tests or? Uh, it's, it's for, no, the plan actually is to use it for all tests for an embedded Linux project. Right now, we're actually focused mostly on user space tests. Now, the user space tests, and especially things like LTP, end up testing a lot of kernel features. Like, LTP has a whole POSIX test suite embedded in it, and it has real-time tests, uh, and then we have a bunch of file system tests, so there's networking tests, and a lot of that, they're all, all of the stuff that we're doing the one thing that we want to get integrated that we haven't yet is uh, the kernel, the K-self test, uh, to make it so that you can run a suite of those automatically from, from Fuego. But most, most of the, all of the tests we have now are actually just user space tests. So they're generic tests of just functionality on, on a target device. Um, so I'm still not sure if I'm answering your question, but. <laughs> but I guess the answer is no, I think, because I think the question was, are we only testing kernels? And the answer is no, we're really testing the whole system. I, th I think uh, our, our focus was to use it more for uh, distribution testing. Yeah. And uh, so we are, like, we, I, what I, from my side, I feel is like we need improvements to handle more, uh, like, more test cases for, uh, the framework should be more flexible to handle more open source packages. Right, which can execute the open source test cases, like yeah. No, I actually I actually agree with that, but uh, probably we should save that for the boss that we're going to have this afternoon, where we talk more specifically about Fuego. Okay. So, so maybe we can talk more about that because I have some ideas. There was some discussion at Plumbers from guys who were doing distribution tests uh, at Intel and at SUSE, and they had a lot of kind of interesting ideas that I think we should kind of look at, but uh, but. I was going to save that for the afternoon discussion. So maybe one trouble point what we see is like how do you set up a network related test case along with Fiat? Right, right, right. Yep, that's an issue as well. That's we got all this stuff is on our <laughs> list. <laughs> but uh, anyway, okay. Thank so. you. Let's let, bring it up this afternoon and we'll discuss yeah, it. Sorry, we, it's oh, okay. you got to go. We can't. We, we, can. uh, we are not available in the okay. session. So. Well, in that case, I'll talk to you guys <laughs> privately at Sony. <laughs> <laughs> okay. so, yeah, we have a meeting actually next Wednesday. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's good for us. Yeah, that's good for us. They forget that you heard that. <laughs> okay. Any questions or discussions? Yeah, please. Yeah, yes, yeah. It's a timing because the deadline of the call for paper ELC. So today, uh, some program uh, committee members of ELC are here. You <laughs> and uh, your staff, right? Yes, so yeah. to this get the session, and, uh, <laughs> what is the point of when writing the abstract? <laughs> uh, okay. So I will tell you, okay, it's, it's hard to say ahead of time what makes a good presentation. <laughs> but I'll tell you some things that really bug us. <laughs> so uh, I'll tell you some ways to get your thing not accepted. One is to make it about a commercial product. Yeah. Uh, right? We don't like those. We like open talks about open source, mm -hmm. uh, about projects. We like projects. One of the things that's the hardest uh, is we're always trying to balance new material mm -hmm. Uh, versus kind of tutorials. So essentially, uh, experienced developers versus new developers. Uh, it's really hard to balance that. So there's a lot of people who, when they come to ELC, they're very experienced kernel developers, and they kind of want to see what is the latest thing that's going on with the USB subsystem or with the graphics subsystem. And so they want kind of those, like, what's the bleeding edge? What do I need to know if I want to upstream some patches in a particular area? Um, but there's also people who come to ELC who are uh, just starting, 
right? And they need kind of the basic talk about, you know, what is power management? You know, how do I, how do I attack boot time? And so it's really hard for us to, to balance that. I would say in the past we've kind of more looked at talks that were the, the bleeding edge talks. That's what we favored. And, and uh, the reason for that is because we put all of the videos online, uh, if people want to see uh, introductory talks on a topic, there's lots of talks available. Those could be indexed better than they are, but I mean, Google's not bad. You can find the talks if you want to find out about a, a, some kind of old topic. Uh, so, bleeding edge helps, but it's not a requirement. It also, the more people that we think are going to be interested in your talk, mm -hmm. the better. So, if your talk is really, really specific, <laughs> that's, uh, you know, it's like, you know, if your talk is like the time I turned on a flag in the USB controller, it's like, ah, uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so. so I'm, I'm, sure, uh, I, I'm just reading. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, please. That's a kind of so I don't know. I don't know if that was helpful or not. Uh, it okay. Here's a secret, though. Okay. <laughs> so it you can. This does not happen very often, but you can send us your abstract ahead of time. I just email us privately, and we can give. We can tell you what we think of it. Uh, and you know, and and a lot of times, sometimes, sometimes you can't tell what someone's going to talk about. Oh, the other thing that's. Uh, that makes it really hard to judge is if people are really vague. A lot of times people will say, uh, you know, uh, boot up time is a really important problem. I solved boot up time. And that's the entire abstract. And it's like, well, you know, wh what did you do? It's really important to say, you know, what is the specific thing you're going to talk about in a, in a topic area so that we know if it's going to be interesting or useful. Um, anyway. So. But we can give you, like I said, we can give you feedback on, on your abstracts. Should I re erase that portion from the video? Oh, no. <laughs> no, no, that's okay. Is my, I don't have, my, my email's not in the slides, so that's. <laughs> any, uh, any questions or discussion too? Uh, can I actually add that last question? One thing that's really helpful when you're submitting, there's several sections to fill out. Oh. There's the abstract, there's the how will your talk benefit the community. Mm -hmm. Be sure to fill that second part out because that can give us a, a much bigger picture about why your talk is so fantastic. Yeah. And whatever you do, don't if, you're, if your talk is not a tutorial, don't make sure you select the right category for your talk. Because a tutorial takes two slots, and we only accept like maybe two or three of those because our slots are very precious. Uh, so if you have your thing marked as tutorial, it's really rare for it to get accepted. I mean, we do accept some, but they're so our preference is presentations versus tutorials. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, I'm interested in uh, system size. So please right. go back to slide 29. Oh, okay. Probably a faster way to do this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think Nicholas proposed the way to eliminate unused system calls. <laughs> so, and you and uh, oh. Daniel Sun also proposed uh, another way to uh, eliminate system calls. Right. So, uh, I want to know which is the best way to <laughs> use. <laughs> well, okay. So, mine. Okay, so the, the system, I, I worked on this a couple of years ago. The system that I did was kind of a manual system. It, these days, if I wanted to give it a computer science term, it would be feedback-directed optimization. But it really was, was I measured all the system, uh, I, I scanned all the binaries in, in the, uh, the distribution uh, and found all of the syscalls that were made uh, and then made a special link uh, thing to remove those uh, using some macros in the source code. So I want. So there were manual steps involved, and it would and it required you know like a round trip in terms of building 
the distribution and then taking the distribution information to feed it back into the kernel compilation. Um, uh, I think, I'm not sure what, what so who, who else did it? Was it Daniel? Yeah, so what did you do? <laughs> My approach was uh, by tracing and using that trace. Oh, okay, so you did a runtime analysis. Yeah. See, I did a compile time analysis. Mm -hmm. I did a, I did a, I, I scanned the binaries that were in the distribution. And admittedly, I didn't get it all the way to a production grade system because I made a kind of my own uh, distribution myself that really just had BusyBox and a couple of binaries. And then I uh, disassembled those, scanned the disassembly for the syscalls, and then made a list of used syscalls, and then made a list of unused syscalls, and then removed them from the kernel. So theoretically, there's a couple of problems. There's problems with both approaches, right? Uh, the problem with the runtime approach is if you don't exercise all code paths, you might miss one of the syscalls. Uh, uh, the problem with mine, it has the same thing. I was looking for specific patterns in the disassembly, uh, and if if there was something weird, if the compiler did something different to execute a syscall, then I was going to miss it in my analysis. So both of them had their issues. Uh, I can't tell which one is better than the other. It's kind of hard to say. Yeah, but we did the period of the year uh, with their, uh, his talk, and uh, uh, oh. yeah, uh, so that the goal is uh, uh, to reducing the, the, the binary size, but uh, the in his uh, method, uh, his, uh, let's say, the GCC generated the, the uh, sections for each uh, right. function and uh, uh, linking that and uh, linking the, the, the open uh, part. Right. So that uh, uh, it doesn't, uh, let's say, uh, reduce the, the functionality. Yes. It just right. reduces the size, the core size. Right. Yeah, basically, it's, you can think of it as dead code removal, yeah. right? Because the, the linker already knows how to check that a piece of code is uncalled if it's at a module scope, right? It, it knows that there's a whole dot .o that's never referenced that it can remove it. And what, this, what the GC sections does is make every function its own dot .o, essentially. Uh, so that then when the linker does its dependencies, it can eliminate all that code. Yeah. Okay, so... Uh, here I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something here. If, if uh, I would re I saw some research uh, out of uh, I think it was Ghent University, a um, couple and it was it was old. It was back on the two four kernel. But it was, I've always really wanted to do this, and it's uh, run, uh, it's called cold code compression. What I really want to see is I want to see. Uh, this feedback directed optimization where we measure all of the functions that are used by the kernel uh, and then we go in and we do the dead code removal of course but then we also kind of do rare code compression so we go into the kernel we take the functions that are used very very rarely and there's a lot of code paths there uh, that are like error handling cases that you probably you might never hit during a run especially in an embedded product where you've got a very kind of limited user space uh, and compress those, right? And then, so you get a reduction, but they're still there just in case, <laughs> right? And so what happens is you have a stub handler that if you ever hit that code, then you decompress it on the fly, execute it, and you, there's no loss of functionality. Uh, the, when they did this uh, on the 2.4 kernel, they found about a 20% savings in size, which is really substantial compared to a lot of these other things. We worked really hard to get like, you know, 25K or 5K or something out of the kernel. And this was getting like two, 300K out uh, because they were able to compress whole sections of the kernel that are called, uh, basically never called, but you couldn't tell that statically. Um, anyway, that's, that's my pet project. If I had a bunch of free time, which I don't, that's what I would work on. But uh, anyway. I have a comment about the, the, the time mutation. Uh, actually, the, the, the time mutation is uh, good, but uh, uh, it's hard to do it mm -hmm. because that, that, you know, uh, there are many, too many, uh, let's say, configuration parameters. Param right, right, right. <laughs> there are, let's say, uh, very complicated uh, dependencies. Yeah. So that uh, if we, yeah, I just use this one, but uh, for, for enabling this, 
it's uh, uh, enabling this and this and this and this. <laughs> it's no, I, I, I totally agree with you. In yes. fact, that's what my, my keynote in 2014 yeah. was exactly on that topic, that you cannot, it does not scale to do it this way. So yeah. when I gave the talk, Linux had 12,000 configuration options. I think we're up to like 15 or 16,000 now. And it, you, you cannot say that the way you get to a small system size is by knowing all of the information about 16,000 options and their interactions. Okay, that is not scalable. As Linux continues to get bigger and bigger, you just can't do it that way. Uh, you have to, I, and what I said in my keynote is you have to start, you have to do it a different way. You have to start with a very, very small thing and build onto it. You can't take a big thing and, and pull things out. Uh, because it's like the Lego, you know, the Lego is actually a pretty good uh, analogy because if you if you try to take a big, you know, I my son had a Star Destroyer that was a Lego thing and you cannot take it apart cleanly. <laughs> it was all, it was a big mess and so if I want, you know, if I want to make a little TIE fighter, uh, you, you can't do it. You gotta, you gotta start with a different starting point. Uh, so I want to uh, confirm my knowledge. So I think uh, Linux identification is just a kind of, uh, co kind of configuration. So it does not remove uh, any system calls. It does not change uh, system calls. Well, you, most of the identification work has been making uh, things optional, config, co compile time optional, right? So most of the time, sometimes you see stuff like with kernel string refactoring, that was that was actually just size gains with no change in config options. But most of these, like the POSIX timers work, someone adds a new config option, they don't actually change any of the code, they just make it so that you can manually turn that code off. Uh, and uh, and um, like Masanga was saying, it, you, it doesn't scale, right? Because now you have, that's, you know, that's configuration option 16,001 uh, to have to know about. Um, so sometimes, so it does, in a way, it does eliminate the system call, but at a very, I mean, it just, it's compile time on or off. And it, and there's nothing, it's all manual. All of the tinification work has been manual. There's no, no, nothing's made it actually upstream that handles feedback direct to optimization. Uh, so, which both Daniel and I worked on. So. I mean, but in different ways. So I don't, and I think I think the kernel could use it because that's it's so. It wouldn't be so bad if the kernel had sixteen thousand options, if there was an automated way to set them, right? If I didn't have to do it manually, it's the manual part that is the problem. But if there, you know, it's like, but if you could say, well, I'm using feedback directed optimization, or I'm using compiler optimizations to eliminate a whole bunch of code, uh, but it's all automatic. I don't have to know anything as a developer to do it. That's fine. In which case, I think if you if you could get the mechanism for feedback, uh, for accepting feedback into the kernel build stage, if you could get that mechanism in place, I think the actually upstream might be willing to take more configurable items. Although there's a tension there because humans still have to configure the kernel. <laughs> so, but you, you could you could if you had to, you could make something like you know yeah. these config options are not for human use. <laughs> Uh, I, I think that uh, we have a talk on the uh, uh, Provence conference uh, about the, the KCOMP. Which, which one? The Provence conference. Oh, oh yeah. was there? About, yeah. oh, I'm, about I'm the yeah, uh, KCOMP. Uh, that is too uh, complicated because uh, there is a two way to enable, uh, let's say, make a dependency. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, I. I uh, I don't know if I saw that one or not, but I've heard the I've heard the argument about it. Yeah, so that the not uh, maker seems uh, complicated, so that the yeah. integrate uh, or unify that uh, one way to uh, depend on that. Right. Yeah. Okay. Any other any other questions? Okay. This is related to non. Linux uh, kernel item, like for miscellaneous like, like uh, recent days analytics is growing more. Uh, so the data for the analytics is coming from the embedded space. Right. And it is moving, it is integrated with the other high-end systems or PCs for the processing. I think analytics also should be one of the space. 
that should be done in embedded boards for which can gain some had some value or uh, well I'm not sure I'm not sure what you're saying. I mean to if you're talking about I mean most of the when we talk about analytics in the embedded space, we're really usually talking about some IoT functionality, right? So we're talking about putting taking data from some a bunch of sensors and putting it in the cloud and then you can use big data to do things like manage your power grid and have all the cars run off the road or something like that. Um, uh, the so I don't I don't see that though as something that's intrinsic to uh, like the embedded software itself. Um, I guess I I'm not sure what the question is really. I, I Maybe think like some minimal user space package we should. Uh, oh, um, well I think the current IoT stacks have uh, kind of well defined schemas for the types of data that they want to share. Uh, I know that, I mean, I'm most familiar with Allseeing because I've worked with, with that before. And they already kind of know, you know, like what, what, is, what is the type of data that a button delivers, a temperature sensor, a fridge sensor, all that type of stuff. So I don't, um, I don't know, I haven't really gotten deeply involved in that, but I, uh, I think that's kind of a, a domain specific problem. Uh, so I don't know. I, I have I have no strong feelings about. <laughs> and it's just an opinion. Okay. Okay. okay.